Before I get into the main thing I wanted to get into today, there was a couple of things that I wanted to clarify. Not that I probably need to clarify them for the majority of people, but in the context of ochring up, uh, when you're doing it in a cultural situation, like they have here where these two have painted themselves up as clowns, that's offensive. And I don't care where you're doing it, it's still offensive. But, you know, if you had taken your kids to some kind of an event and there was a face painter there and they did, they painted their face there, well, I don't see how that's offensive because it's not taken out of context culturally. They're not, well, I'm sorry, but these two, the way that they're oaked up here, it, how can anyone take them seriously? They look like clowns. You look at it and you tell me that if that's actually not offensive, and they're certainly not kiddies going to get their face painted, or, well, I know a lot of women like to do it because, they, you know, they're, oh, look, I can be, oh, you know, enlightened by painting my face. You know, they're trained into thinking that because of, you know, it comes with the makeup concept. Yes, women know all about masking up and putting on ochre. I mean, half the makeup women wear has got ochre in it. I find it offensive that some women wear so much of it, just as I find it offensive that these clowns are culturally misusing the ochring up. And that's just to clarify on the ochring up that it's a bit different to face painting. So anyone that wants to split hairs over it, you know, I'm going to call you out as a dick. And the other thing that was mentioned, and I have, uh, I've done quite a few videos on this that no one's ever seen because I end up going into these really long videos about it, about the way I see the earth, how I've connected to it all over Australia. When you walk on country, on the country, when you feel it, when you, the rocks are beneath your feet and everything is around you, there is... Oh, well, I don't know what you'd say. It's it's like an impression. You know, when you go to a place and, you know, you, you leave it and you go, hmm, that was a nice little place, I enjoyed that. Or, wow, that was a dump, I don't want to go back there again. I mean, imagine that the impression that I get from the land is something like that it's not something that well if someone said to you said to you why did you like the little town oh well the people were friendly everywhere we went we you know um there was we could there were all these different shops where we could buy things and all this sort of stuff and i mean every person would have a different reason on why a town might be good for them or bad for them Getting back to my point about the earth, the rocks, what makes up, what we stand on and what everything survives on. The um, crust of the earth is the living history of the planet. And that's written in stone, literally. And if you know how to read it, you can read it. I mean, I've studied a lot of geology in fact, just about every place I go, one of the first things I do is look up a, one of those really fandangled geological maps so I can see what they think is in the area of how the, the stone, the earth, is built there. But when it comes to the crystals and the stones, the rocks, I do know how Aboriginals feel about them. Like There was um, one guy I met in Nimbin, out at Nimbin Rocks, he would not even touch the rocks. You know, I've got this real thing for rocks. I, I love them. I pick them up. I touch them. And, you know, you go down to the Broken Bridge at Nimbin and you can find rocks down there. I call them the singing rocks because they, they make a tone that is unlike any rock I've ever heard before. And, you know, most people would look at them and 
think nothing of them because they're grey, they're boring and they're yuck. But, you know, these were wonderful. Now, I'm sharing this because there's a lot of aspects. You see, I have been collecting rocks since I was a kid. My brother was involved in lapidry. We used to go all over Tasmania, different places, collect stones so that you could bring them back and tumble them and everything. And even over the years, you know, I've collected my rocks. <laughs> I can't uh, live without them, so to speak. Everywhere I go, I collect rocks. I've probably left more rocks in places than what I've, yeah, had hot lunches. Just so many. You know, people go to look at different things, but my kids would get sick of me. My head's down, I'm looking at, at the rocks. And we might be driving along the road and I spot something and I've got to stop and look at the rocks. Because they all tell a story. And, you know, like others, I had bought my rocks, I went into shops and I got all these crystals and all these different rocks because I thought, oh, well, I have to possess them. I, n I need to own them to get the power out of them. And then when I got those rocks in my hand, I suddenly realised that, you know, that was like the equivalent of getting something tortured, that I wasn't getting the real rock. I was getting something that was polished and made to be something that it wasn't. And then I started thinking about, well, why do I need to actually have the rocks? I mean, aren't I connected to the planet which is made up of all the rocks and all the rocks are touching all the other rocks? So in a way, aren't I connected to all the rocks on the planet? So thereby, I wouldn't need to connect any to have on me personally. Because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that use them all these polished rocks in their new age rituals and everything. And as far as I'm concerned, ah, oh, you might as well just not even have it there. Because you don't find a rock polished like that in the ground. That's man-made. That has been tainted and shaped by man. And it's not the shape that nature formed it in. And it hasn't got the message in it that nature had. Nature produces stuff in the raw. She leaves it up to us to polish up that information. Not to polish her, but to polish our understanding. So I got to the stage where I realised that I don't need to collect the rocks anymore. And after having it viewed to me, and there was always this sense that, you know, like any time I picked up a rock from somewhere and I took it home with me, and sometimes I'd moved to a different state, I felt like I had just, I don't know, kidnapped somebody and taken them from their home. You know, and there was sometimes I'd look at the rocks and I'd think, I wonder if in a thousand years' time, Someone will find these rocks sitting here and think they were formed here, but they're not in place with everything else. So they'll wonder, how did those rocks get there? And those rocks would have got there by no more or less of a means than me putting them there. Out of place, they don't tell the story they're meant to tell in the planet. And thereby, you change the story. So when you go to somewhere, like there are a lot of people that, you know, you talk about the energy grid of the planet and special places that will activate the, uh, activate the chakras and all of this, create a, a new age enlightenment and all that stuff. And we saw just recently at Uluru how the new ages went into an area because because of their beliefs. Yeah, I've seen it happen in Hawaii at, um, oh damn, I can't remember the name of it now, and um, Mount Shasta in, um, was it California? Uh, they've done it in lots of places for various different reasons because they think that this one place has this 
energy grid connection that makes it especially powerful where they can utilize their powerful abilities to activate the planet and the energy grid and all that. Without the understanding that the very, look, you want to be connected to the most sacred and energetic places on the planet. You look at that energy grid, they're all connected, okay? They don't exist in isolation, they're all connected. Which means that no matter where you stand on this planet, you are connected. And you don't actually need to physically go to that place to be connected to that place. To be connected to the ground, the earth and the country there. Use your, you know, how you, you visualize and you go there. Astral travel and project there. You don't need to physically be there to be connected. And in that sense, you also don't need to go into these places where people uh, have practiced their cultural beliefs for tens of thousands of years. And, well, I've brought up this thing on Uluru before. And, you know, there are some that completely disagree with, you know, come on, you're, you're not being very nice about this. Look, like so many others, I want everyone in this planet to get along. But there's a huge but in that. That's an ideal. When it comes to the reality of it, how do you actually achieve that? Because without compromise on behalf of every single human being in this planet, we will never meet uh, in agreeance or meet in treaty. See, all these people here are demanding, demanding that their perspective take precedence. And it's not the only perspective. You would think that they actually represent their whole tribe. They don't. I mean, this woman here could be my grandmother. You know, and I'm sorry, but... I know it, it, people I'm not yeah I'm not gonna say it no I'm gonna move on and get to the point because I think I've yeah said enough anyway and besides there's always another video isn't there so the, what I wanted to bring up today was something that had been raised with me um, a little while ago now I haven't actually got to putting it together because I, I actually wanted to put more on this blog because there's another document out there and there's um, several treaty documents that the OSTF have had up, versions of things that people get to sign. So I'll add this to this post so it'll be evolving. But the reason that I started doing all that was because I wanted to bring up what she actually makes, well, this lady here, who she never states who she is, but that's why I have to call her she, sorry. <laughs> but what she states, um, she's reading out a statement. And that statement can be found here on their blog site. It's, um, hang on, where we go? Oh, get off that blog. It's, uh, where are we? Oh, <laughs> walk straight past, walk straight past it, went straight past it. Um, it's this one here. So all I did was go into that place and copy and paste it over here. And it starts off with the statement that she's going to read. And Quickly, before I get on to that, before I forget to mention it, the link for, I'll leave a link for this, but go, do go on here and click on this link. Let me show you where it leads to. It's a GoFundMe page. And they've raised 6,000 out of 150,000 gold. So it's the OSTF Donation Fund 2020. 
and says down here, Jason Hartwig is organising this fundraiser on behalf of Helen Bray. Well, so clearly if it's an OSTF donation fundraiser, Jason Hartwig and Helen Bray should be able to answer the questions on what happens to the money that they're receiving on the GoFundMe page. Well, first of all, where does it get paid into and then where does it go out to? Now, you don't have to tell me, but those people that are interested in joining the OSTF can't even ask those kinds of questions and get an answer. So you're actually putting off your potential well, customers by not answering, you know, on your sales and marketing pitch. But the thing I love is that they want donations to continue the fight. And it's like, well, what fight have you done in the last five years? Nothing. And, you know, an interesting thing was that I was actually looking at Mark Darwin's, um, what was it, a Free to Shine, Nikki Mai or me. And she has got... Free to Shine website that she collects donations for. There's a million different photographs of kids smiling everywhere, of all these different things where that money has gone back into the community, showing what it's given to the community. What's OSTF done for your community? If you've been part of it, I should leave a link for Free to Shine so you can have a look through the images. You can see this little dumpy little house, I wouldn't even call it a house that these people were expected to live in. So they used donated funds to build them a place off the ground and with um, steel, oh, what do you call them? Stilts, get them up off the ground. So this is how the donated money was going back into the community to help the community where it was needed. Now, OSTF are taking donations for the, the good of the tribes. And yet, tell me, yeah, you know, I guarantee you there's at least one person out there that could have had a house built for them, or they could have actually repaired a house. Or a lot of that housing that they said isn't out there. They could have used that money to build housing. You know, but instead, now they've got their hand out because their pockets are empty. Meanwhile, Mark McMurtry is sitting on a $36 million development. The original Sovereign Tribal Federation has also got a registered ABN for a trust discretionary. So that any and all funds that are taken and received cannot be identified either. So, you know, where they look to set up a tax dodge, there's always the flip side. If you need to prove you got ripped off, you've got no chance. And that's what people should remember. If the law can't prove that that's what you got up to, well, then if you jump in bed with them and you give them your money, how the hell do you expect to prove to a court of law that they did to you what they did to you? It's all designed to be hidden, concealed. And the OSTF has got its own very hidden ABN trust. And I'm pretty sure from memory, I don't quote me on this, I'd have to confirm it, but pretty sure it was only set up last year. Now, you only set up those kinds of things when you intend to hide a lot of money or deal with a lot of money or justify the existence of money. Yeah, there's a few other reasons, but I won't go into them anyway. I just wanted to cover those things before I get on to the thing that I was really wanting to, to get on to before. This woman here reads out this statement here. And I compared it because those ones written in bold are not, she didn't say those words and what was written in red she added like 
uh, what's on here, she added forced into enslavement, having. She added that in to what was... And the thing being that you'd say, well, oh, no, you can hear as she reads it that she does correct herself where, uh, you know, she might have missed a few words. So ultimately there were edits that um, didn't didn't make it through onto this copy that she said something differently. It's not much. But one of the first things, and why I'm bringing it up, is because of Chukupa. And Chukupa is the Anangal tribal law. And I've been asked to actually ask people to stop using it for the simple fact that it is associated with the Anungal law and dream time it is theirs and it is the foundation of a lot of their law and dream time and if you understand this of your own dream time and law that you're trying to actually put all the tribes uh, by saying that Chukupa, Anungal law, tribal law, is applicable to them and you're all working under that. And uh, that is simply not the case. And so I've been asked to pass it on that the OSTF stop using Anungal tribal law to stop using Chukupa. It is mentioned here, well, she didn't actually read it there, but she did read it further down. And now she may be a Nungal, but she does not have the right to represent that for the rest of the tribe and in a way to reveal things that are just for the tribe. The, you know, I don't know how to explain to people that where they can get it, that there are certain things that belong to you as a person, There are and they're private, you know, only you know them. And then there are certain things that belong to you and your family and your friends around you and only you know them. And then there's a level where only those outside, you know, of your known circle know them. Chukupa, Anungal law, is for Anungal people. It is not for using as a broad blanket for all the tribes to make a unilateral declaration on behalf of what? All the tribes in Australia? That's what unilateral is, isn't it? One? One declaration for all? <laughs> you know? And to put it under the Chukupa, the um, Anungal tribal law, when there are so many other tribal laws and names that are not being respected, maybe to put anything under you know, if the OSTF wanted to invent a tribal word that meant that all of the, well, something that all of the tribes could actually agree on. Instead of taking a word, part of their law, Chukupa is family business, family and friends only. It is not for others to be a part of. It's not that it's some great secret or anything. It's just really none of your business. And it is personal to them. And to use it in such a public statement, well, as I said, they have found it offensive and have asked me to pass it on to the OSTF to not use Chukupa. It is not something that belongs to all the tribes. It belongs to the Anungal. It is their tribal law, their 
part of their dream time. You do not apply it. In, well, it, it's just inappropriate, really inappropriate, to use one tribe's law, especially when you are not representing that tribe, to represent all in the OSTF. And by actually putting it down in this statement as I think that the only reason that whoever authored this mouthful of garbage, which is probably, you know, Mark McMurtry, because that sounds like stuff he'd come up with, because nobody speaks like this. This woman even had a hard time reading all the guff. She doesn't even talk like that. So if people don't ordinarily talk like that, how the hell are you expected to be understood or even to be taken credible. What, you think that just because you can get up there and you can talk a bunch of smart words? Well, no, that's not the way it works. It's, it's actually a matter of sitting down around a round table and rather instead of making demands, um, meeting equal, halfway, give and take. Not just, right, I demand this now. But... Going back to the Chukupa, you cannot, well, you cannot use that in a sense that is not inside the Anangul ceremonies and within that tribal community. It is not appropriate for anyone else to use it. And they are offended that you are leading the OSTF in a public manner by using their law, their dream time. It is the foundation for so much of what they hold near and dear to them. And yet if I say these things, I'm going to have some dick I guarantee you that turns around and says, I don't know anything. Well, the fact is, I'm the bearer of the message. I don't need to know it. I am telling you how these people feel that they do not like having these things revealed it is not as I said it's not a secret it's just personal personal family business and you know the thing that really gets me just um, my son told me a couple of days ago that uh, Vikings had released the final ones and I started watching that and I remember when uh, the thing was brought up now years ago when Vikings first started I'd already known all about the thing one of the still oldest existing forms of government today the thing so it wasn't called Parliament they weren't called senators you know, they didn't make laws or anything like that. And so, you know, it was just, I've called the thing. <laughs> Real official, isn't it? And it's still called that today, the thing. So when you have people that are claiming to represent Aboriginal Australians calling to reconvene the government or the parliament, it's like, oh, piss off. One, those words don't actually exist in any Aboriginal language. The closest you are going to get to it is treaty. There is no such word for Senate or Parliament, or probably even Sovereign. But I know this for a fact of, of the other words because I've been told, I checked them out, I asked. There's no word and you see, because there's no word for these things, how the hell do you actually translate them to the elders? You know, the tribal elders that are out there, where English is their second language, and really, if they don't need to use it, why bother? And then someone comes along and tries explaining to them what, what that was in English, when half the words that person used there isn't even a, a word for it in Aboriginal and 
if you would like to take all the words that are used in this tribal notice and find out how many words are actually you're ever going to find in any Aboriginal language, I dare you to. Is there anything like social engineering, tribal sovereigns subjected to? What about genocide? What about federation? <laughs> do you even have a word for original? Yeah, I probably do. First, before, ancestor. You've probably got lots of names for basic concepts when it comes to things that are to do with, well, the nature of things. Half the words in here, like all Aboriginal Indigenous agents. Indigenous agents? I mean, that's an insult. They're trying to actually say, you know, all of you that are a sellout to our kind, when it's only their perspective that they are a sellout. And see, here used again, Chukupa. It is not, <laughs> and not standing exclusively under Chukupa tribal or and other law. I mean, yeah, I'd like to actually meet an elder uh, if I understood the language and hear them actually speak in such a twisted way that sounds like even normal Australians don't speak like that. The only place you get crap like that is where they talk double Dutch in court. You know, it's ridiculous. One thing I notice too, and I do it sometimes too, instead of giving the negative to something, I give the positive to it. And where was it that, hang on. Yes, here where she said, purporting to have authority to act on behalf of the sovereigns are unauthorised to act. She actually said, are authorised to act. She forgot to say the un. But, you know, bless her, she did a really good job because, you know, there's a whole group of guys around. Now, the guys could have made this declaration, but, you know, that's not as good a sell as getting Granny to do it, is it? And because Granny, when she gets down to the last, last part here, she gets all choked up and all teary and say so, yeah she she gives her a rub on the shoulder because she's barely keeping it together she's so emotional and upset because she just wants us all to get along so you get all these people getting stomping into a place but she gets upset because they just want to get along well you don't go in making demands and well like with all the activists that say you know we're not going to follow your rules and then turn around and lay down all your own rules, what do you expect to get out of it? The best, you're going to make the news and most people are going to think you're a joke. You're not going to be taken seriously because <laughs> you are just like my nana who stormed into the council chambers and made a complaint. She embarrassed the family on TV. No, that never happened, but you know what I'm talking about. It didn't change anything, and it just made shit worse for her. And did it make things worse? Well, I also saw a post yesterday from David Cole, where apparently the government, uh, have been, they've been told by the government, you've got to shut down and stop what you're doing, or we're going to come against you. <laughs> It's like, yeah, go on, sweet. Uh, any government officials out there listening, you can shut down the OSTF any time because that would save a lot of people. Yeah, by all means, go for it. You know what, that's the first time I've actually think that I'd actually welcome something like that. <laughs> Bring them on in. hope so. Because, you know, it's not just the government that find them a threat. You know, they're only a threat to the government because they're an annoyance. 
they're, they're more than annoyance within the tribes themselves. They're quite literally pulling the tribes apart from within, causing division in opinions within the tribe. The, the unities aren't even in the tribe anymore. They can't agree on, on the same thing because you've got all these people now that have been infected with this mentality of this extremism that, oh, it might sound good in pretty words, but in 10 years, Mark McMurtry has never achieved one success with any of those words. And he's not only tried with the OSTF, he's also been called into court for Adrian Brennock when he was in court in 2016, trying to save his house from getting taken. Because after he decided, well, you know what, I'm sovereign and I don't have to pay back the loan, so they came against him, wanted the, the money and the house back, and he brought in his little tribal mate, you know, Mark McMurtry, and he came in in his tribal name to try and put validity on the fact that he's a sovereign tribal person and we're claiming sovereign tribal um, rights over Adrian Brennock's house. Hmm. I wonder was that the same house that was referred to in the Vox of Adrian Brennock where he sent Mark McMurtry to go and get uh, a signature from one of the elders for the court case to save his house. So I wonder if back in 2016 if Mark McMurtry appeared in court and that was part of his affidavit and statements and evidence that he provided. So I think I might leave it at that today. I think I've probably said enough that I've probably offended someone. <laughs> you know, I don't set out to offend anyone, but I actually am honest enough and realistic to know that there is not one single human being in this planet that would be able to say something that everybody agreed with. That's an impossibility. So the simple fact is of it, some people are going to like what you say, some people are not going to like what you say. And it doesn't matter what you say then, there will always be those that agree and those that disagree. But I will finish it off by saying that the essence of what is trying to be achieved, I really do understand and I believe in, much as I believe in the essence of the people that went into NICAP on Minjimbal and what they wanted to achieve. These are all things that we need to work towards as human beings. We don't live in a perfect society. And you know what? We're never going to live in perfection. Because, well, maybe you could live in the illusion of perfection if you lived on an island on your own and you didn't have to work in with anything else or anybody else. But, yeah, that would get boring quick, wouldn't it? The thing being that I am not saying don't have the dreams or don't aspire for the ambitions, the, the heart that is behind uh, the tribes wanting to achieve more independence within their own laws. And that's all it is. You don't need to put all these fancy names on it. You just want to be recognised within your own space and by your cultural traditions. I mean, if we can recognize the cultural traditions um, of other cultures in the world, why can't we recognize all those within? I mean, we have already, you know, got rid of so many Christian, you know, words and terminologies and practices out of schools and that because we might offend somebody if we actually practiced our traditional heritage. Not that, you know, as I've 
said previously that the Christian heritage is, well, even when I was a kid, you know, you'd have people that would be horrible for six days of the week, go to church one day a week and they think they're saints the rest of the week and they can do whatever they want. They don't understand that everything that we do, and I suppose this is why Jesus gets across to so many people, because it's not a, a matter of going to a church once a week and saying, please forgive me and not doing anything. It's a matter of walking the talk. And if there is one message that ever came out of Jesus, is that walk your talk. Be true to yourself and to your beliefs. And, you know, there were plenty of Jews who found out during the Second World War that doing exactly what Jesus did was deadly, as, as deadly. You know, so standing true to your convictions isn't necessarily uh, good for the health, but it's good for the soul. Because, and that's the whole point, that it doesn't matter whether the bad things are done to you in this lifetime. It's what it's done to you. Has it turned you into something that is, well, I know that when people get frustrated and they try to achieve something and it never keeps happening, someone comes along with a bright idea and it sounds really good. And so you jump on that idea and you go with it because you're really hoping and praying that they've got it figured out and that it will achieve what you haven't been able to. Now the thing is that this is what salesmen are good at doing. Believing that something is really, really good and it's the answer to all your prayers. That's why you're supposed to buy what they're selling. But what they're selling is not something that they even own or possess. They're selling you the promise that maybe one day they might be able to overturn the laws that are entrenched in this country. Entrenched, okay? It's not just something that you can go in and go, right, I'm going to make this statement, done. I win. Oh, please. Mark McMurtry has had more failures because that does not work. And still, they're doing the things that do not work. You want to achieve your connection back to your tribal heritage, your lands and everything. You need to come at it sitting at the table talking not making demands and certainly not appropriating one tribe's um, culture to use as a, an umbrella to put all the OSTF under. Uh, you know, that that is even so disrespectful to even any of the other tribes that are in there. That is not their sacred law. You know, and really, the only ones that you are going to get to sign up under that are ones that don't know the law. And, well, that's quite clear. A lot of them don't already know it anyway. There's a lot of issues that I could bring up around this. A lot of questions that have been raised about... Um, yeah, even tribes now that are going into other tribes' land, staking claims on it. I mean, I thought this shit was over, you know, years ago, that people were just arguing now over, you know, like with um, the Bunjilung and Minjimbul the, and the Naraku, that there is some overlap of claims on tribal land. I didn't think that they could actually start anew because, well, anyway. <laughs> now, just before I finish off, I will just tell you, oops, I appear further. What I have started, these are links I've uh, done because there was the WordPress site, the Webly site or Weebly, and 
than this one here, which is the current one. So um, I've tried to distinguish the three of them because the this one now seems to be an old one, as does the WordPress one. The WordPress one didn't seem to have anything done once this one came up. And this one doesn't seem to have had anything done in years. And then they made this one up. You'd think that they could just add to this one. But anyway, so I've left links, some of them, on here. Uh, see, that's a web archive one. That'll take you back to the pages that aren't linked on what does come up. And you can have a little bit of a, a hunt around in there yourself. You know, some of the links work and will bring up and some of them don't. So I know there was something else I wanted to say, but I've forgotten it. So yeah, another one, I suppose. <laughs> and on that note, I'll say I'll catch you next time. Take it easy.